Welcome, everyone. Um, you, this is um, the first live stream that I'm doing today. So I'm just trying to get a take a look at the dashboard and kind of see what's what's what. Um, yeah, and so if you're watching this live, that's great. And if it's um, you're watching the recorded version, that's um, Great to you. Thank you for being here and uh, taking the time. So I just decided to do a live stream because I felt it would be more interactive and um, more intimate. And uh, also to answer any questions that people might have about the types of things that I talk about on this community and channel. Mainly, I talk about, I share my personal and professional experiences. Um, if you're new, my name is Nesseret, and I am the creator of Confessions of a Psych Nurse on YouTube. I am a mental health coach, and I also have uh, 17 years experience as a psych nurse. And I have a personal story of recovery from antidepressant-induced bipolar disorder through utilizing metabolic therapies and the ketogenic diet. And so on this channel, that's what I talk about and share essentially the challenges of navigating the current mental health system as it is. And my experience as a psych nurse was um, in the Canadian mental health system. So I know there's lots of similarities between that and the States and other parts of the world as well. So mental health is something that impacts pretty much all of us. And especially currently, uh, there's a huge mental health crisis, the second leading cause of death for youth between the age of 14 and 24 is suicide, there's about a billion people that are impacted by mental health issues and addictions issues. And about 700 people, 700,000 people a year that commit that take their own lives. So the issues and challenges that I bring up in this kind of community is around sort of the one size fit, fit all approach that is used in the current system, which is very heavily leaning towards the biomedical model, essentially medication. <clears throat> and medications can be useful and even life-saving at certain times. But for many people, they can they also come with a lot of risk. And typically it should be medications need to be used at a temporary measure. They're meant to be used as a temporary measure. But often people end up staying on medications for a very long time and having to live with a lot of unwanted effects, sometimes adverse effects and toxicity. And other times they're able to tolerate them to some extent, but they are not always helpful in the long term. Really, nobody knows um, the long term effect of psychiatric medications. And everyone responds to medications differently. So, some people it might work for them, for other people, it is something that creates actually more problem for them than they started with. So this is kind of a, a challenging situation. And the other piece is that many a times I feel that diagnoses and medications are rushed. People are not given adequate time for them to explore the meaning of their life experiences or challenges or even a crisis. There, there are, um, I think it was a, a Chinese saying, um, every crisis has an opportunity within it. I could be completely mistaken about where this uh, saying comes from, but I really um, appreciate it because I think in modern medicine and psychiatry, there is a tendency to rush into diagnosing and medicating without giving people really an opportunity to take time to understand themselves and the life's journey and whatever challenges that they're going through and experiencing. So 
many people end up being given diagnosis in the midst of crisis, in the midst of like a breakup or a job loss, or they've just lost someone that they loved and they're struggling or even going through a situation like with substance abuse. And I think that is really rushed and there hasn't been adequate time given for them to explore what's happening for them. And, and then once, you know, when people are offered medications, they are not fully informed of all the risks that they're taking by taking that medication. Most of the time, clinicians, physicians, and psychiatrists alike gloss over the full ramification of that decision. They may say, you know, this is safe, it's tolerated by many people, and, um, you know, they might mention some mild effects of the medications, but they're not going through and mentioning the full range of what could happen to a person if they take this medication, what are the mild effects? What are the moderate effects? What are the long-term effects? What are the adverse effects? Um, what about toxicity? Um, the black box warning. And so all of these things need to be thoroughly explored and covered before a person makes can make that decision to get on medication. I know I can look back uh, in my own experience and think, one of the greatest mistakes that I made was to get on psychiatric medication. And even being a psych nurse, I didn't understand fully how I was going to react to it. And so I would say um, today's live stream is titled Three Essential Steps to Take Charge of Your Mental Health. And one of those is really to be in tune with your body and listen to the feedback that it gives you. Our bodies are pretty sophisticated and they give us feedback moment to moment. And this is about mindfulness and paying attention to what's really going on for you, uh, especially when you're starting on a, medic a new medication and paying very close attention to all of the feedback that your body is telling you. And it's easy to kind of sidestep that and listen to authority whether that's your physician or psychiatrist, and just go with the flow when you know things are not going well. And so that's one of the things that I offer to people. The three steps, one is being mindful of your body signal and being in tune with your body. Two is questioning everything, including professions and including, um, you know, the narrative of what's given to you in the psychiatric industry. And I had to do that for myself as well. And the third one is knowledge and research and study. That was what allowed me to take control of my mental health. And I'm going to go into detail into each of these um, areas. Um, but for me, it wasn't even just questioning authority. It was also questioning my profession as a psych nurse. Is this actually helpful to people? Is what I'm doing making a difference in people's lives? And over time, it became really tough to see people struggling and suffering and being heavily medicated most of the time and not getting better. And I had that same experience where I ended up on a cocktail of medications. And when I look back now, I realized my mental health actually steadily declined after getting started on psychiatric medications and navigating through the mental health system as a service user, as opposed to a clinician. And so to me, it was not just questioning authority on in terms of like what I was hearing and listening from other people, but also, and you know, what I was being told, but it also made me question my own profession. And I think there's a lot of mental health professionals in that boat as well that you go through this process of working in the industry and it's really tough after a while to continue to see people struggling and suffering and not really getting the results that they want and moving forward in their lives. So my journey back to health um, was 
a lengthy process and there was many steps along the way. But I think the first step, again, is that attunement to your body and being able to listen and see the feedback that you're getting. And for me, um, it was a lot of adverse reactions. And for you, it might be something different. But many people, when they get on um, psychiatric medications, will notice changes. And some of them may be beneficial initially. There is, you know, the placebo effect, but also there is... Um, there might be benefits. And then there's also unwanted effects or side effects or adverse effects or toxicity that people experience. That should be your guiding sort of, um, your body is your guide. Your body is gonna give you the signals that you need of what's working and what's not working. And then, um, Many people also struggle when they go to their clinician and share these things. The answer is always to, uh, most of the time, to either have additional medication or increase the dose of the medication or try something else. So there, again, there's not adequate time given to let people kind of go through this process and review what's working and what's not working. And it can be a really uh, tough situation. And the other piece is also um, being able to explore alternative and complementary avenues of healing. And there's many different paths that people can explore in healing. For me, like seven years ago, I um, started tapering off certain medications, for example, uh, birth control pill. That was something that really was not helpful in the long run. And so that was something I decided to taper off of and that was helpful. The other thing is I gave up uh, shift work. And so I was able to really reset my circadian rhythm. So sleep might be another area that could be helpful to look at. There's some fundamentals that you want to explore uh, alternative approaches. And then um, another one is diet, which is a huge piece and um, intermittent fasting and many other uh, approaches, exploring spirituality, meaningful work, exploring healthy connections. There are so many different things that you can explore that could be helpful to you. But all of that is going to require for you to really pay attention to your body and its reactions and what's helpful and what's not helpful. Um, so that's, that's one area to work on. Another one, um, what I did was that at that time I started researching and found a community of people who believed diet has a huge connection with mental health um, I came across the work of Dr. Chris Palmer, uh, Dr. Georgia Ede, uh, Metabolic Mind on YouTube, Bipolar Cast on YouTube. So all of these um, people and communities are doing research and educating the public and raising awareness between the link, um, the link between diet, nutrition, and mental health. That was extremely helpful and a very different narrative than the traditional kind of um, psychiatric conventional system where you're told you have a chemical imbalance and in your brain, which is a theory and that's all it is. There's no scientific sort of evidence of like a brain scan or blood test or anything like that that shows that a person has a chemical imbalance. But we know that the medications that are prescribed in psychiatry are under the umbrella of psychoactive drugs, and they do have an effect on your brain. And so do being able to do that research and looking at a different narrative of what could be the cause of <laughs> mental illness was a huge part. Now, 
there's multiple factors that create imbalance in a person, mentally, physically, in every way. It's not, it's never one thing. There are many things. Diet could be one of them. Genetics is another one. Trauma and stress is a huge one. Um, um, so physical activity can make a difference. Walking can be as effective as antidepressants. Um, so it's not, and stress is another one. That's a huge factor. So there's not one thing that... Uh, you know, causes a physical illness or a mental illness per, per se. There's many factors, which means also that there's many things that can be implemented to help your situation. And I don't look at mental illness as hopeless or incurable or um, something that a person has to deal with for the rest of their lives. And I know that's a very different narrative and belief than the conventional system. But, you know, I was able to put antidepressant induced bipolar disorder into remission using metabolic therapies and simple lifestyle interventions. And in the past year, I was able to taper off of multiple psychiatric medications and actually have had a period of stability um, where I haven't had a manic episode or a depressive episode. I've had lots of energy, um, mood stability. I'm able to focus. I didn't have any more brain fog. I was sleeping about 12, 13 hours when I was on medication. I was fatigued most of the time. I had gained 20 pounds. I had um, an intensifying suicidal ideation. So I actually was trialed on like 10 different medications over a 13 year period. And I would say I had adverse reactions to every single one of those medications and, um, and unwanted effects and for some toxicity. I would say about eight of those medications I had to immediately get off of within anywhere from three days to 10 days to two weeks. And then there was one medication that I had a fatal reaction to, and it was uh, Lamictal. And um, so essentially, I was in the camp of people who didn't tolerate psychiatric medications very well at all. And I think there are certain groups of people that can tolerate psychiatric medications, whether and still live with some unwanted side effects, but they feel that the benefits outweigh the risk. But there's also a group of people that have a horrific reaction to psychiatric medication and cannot tolerate them at all. And I think being able to explore alternative approach is part of that process for those people. And I think in terms of metabolic therapies and the ketogenic diet, it can actually have an impact on anyone because essentially what you're doing is again you're paying attention to your body's reaction to food food um one of my favorite um authorities in this area is dr georgia Eid, and she talks about how food is the precursor for our brain chemicals and so one of those powerful interventions is the ketogenic diet but it could be other diets for you as well. It could be paleo, it could be uh, carnivore. But the idea, the core principles behind food used as medicine is one, not putting um, food into your body that is harmful. And so that could be sugar, carbs, processed food. And for certain people it could be gluten or dairy. And it, this depends on every person in terms of what might be helpful and what's not helpful to them. And then the other piece is being able to give your body the proper nutrition that it needs, which is usually whole foods and protein and healthy fats. So it's not complicated, but it is, I would say, uh, the ketogenic diet for me 
was one of the most powerful interventions I've, I've ever come across. And if you think about it, diet is a huge, plays a huge role in people's health. Even let's say in North America, the top three killers in North America right now are obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And I would say all of them can be greatly helped with proper diet and proper uh, nutrition and also exercise and movement. And this doesn't have to be anything complicated. It could just be something simple as walking or yoga or hiking or swimming. It's whatever works for you. So, and the other piece is when you look at sort of like what's being told and in the public of what's healthy for us, even when it comes to nutrition, for example, for many years now, fat has been kind of demonized and said, you know, this is not good for you, it causes heart disease and such. But the truth about like the human diet and nutrition is actually our bodies need fat to for many processes and uh, to function properly. So the ketogenic diet is very low in carbs, like 20 to 50 grams of carbs, moderate protein, uh, that's calculated based on your body weight and height and such. And then you can also have, I would say the majority of your calories are coming from fat. And so I, I would say like most people throughout their life, they're on the wrong diet because what is taught in the public about what's a healthy diet is actually opposite to what people need, require and their bodies based on our ancestors and what the human body was designed to process. But again, I'm not particularly ad advocating for one diet or another. If you find something that works for you and you're really in tune to your body and that is positive feedback, meaning you have energy, you have mental clarity, mood stability, you're feeling healthy and well, then keep doing that. But if that's not occurring, then you have to question like what's actually going on. And what I'm excited about this kind of research that I've come across, and I'll put a link in the description to all of the resources that I mentioned, Dr. Palmer's work, Dr. Ede, Metabolic Mind, um, Bipolar Cast, and there's many others, but these were the, the communities that was really helpful to me in my journey of going through that process and implementing the ketogenic diet that you're going to find that many of the things that we've been taught about nutrition, about what it takes to be have a healthy body and about a healthy mind are not always accurate and or helpful. Likewise, what you've been told about psychiatric medications, that they are safe and they are well tolerated by most people and they don't cause dependency. And when you taper, there shouldn't be any problem. You should be able to taper pretty quick within a couple of months. Like those things are not true either entirely. And so my second point was like to question everything. I had to go through that process of questioning what I've been taught about nutrition, questioning in my education, what I've been taught even as a psych nurse, and questioning all of the things um, okay so i have a question here um is intermittent fasting good for mental health yeah that's an excellent question um i would say absolutely i think um i would approach it cautiously depending on who you are and what's going on with your health. So I would always have like a medical workup before you start any type of um, change. But I did intermittent fasting for a couple of years prior to starting the ketogenic diet. And that is one way. So the ketogenic diet works in um, allowing you to get into ketosis. So you get into a fat burning mode as opposed to burning glucose. So our bodies can burn two types of kind of fuel that is fat and glucose. And the fat burning mode produces ketones and ketones are fantastic for the brain and body. 
And so intermittent fasting, I would say, is one of the quickest ways to get into ketosis. And if it's done correctly, and I would suggest people, like I said, approach it very carefully, really paying attention to your body, uh, making sure that you're not going to go into low blood sugar um, and or lose weight too fast. Um, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with intermittent fasting. But if you essentially go into it um, carefully, um, most people would start with something like having the eating window of eight hours and then fasting for uh, 16 hours, for example, that's one kind of uh, way to go or even 12 and 12, you could start with something like 12 hours of fasting and 12 hours of eating window. And then you can increase the fasting window longer to 16 hours or 18 hours or 20 hours. And what that does is um, it allows you to um, get into ketosis just and adapt slowly as you go. Um, there's a ton of research nowadays that's coming out on intermittent, intermittent fasting. I know historically people did intermittent fasting for religious reasons, but there's actually a ton of scientific research that's coming out now that shows the benefit of fasting. And for weight loss, for um, even if you, uh, when you're able to do longer fast, there's something called autophagy, which is basically your body will go ahead and cleanse sort of like dead cells, cells that weren't working properly. And there's been huge benefits uh, with fasting in many areas for people. But I would say one of the fascinating thing that I found when I was going through intermittent fasting um, is the mindfulness. So if you're talking about mental health, it really helps you tune into your um, body and your mind, because your mind will kind of go through all kinds of questions and things. Oh, is this good for me? And then it also shows you your relationship, like really clearly with food and eating. Um, and of course, there's a lot of I've found that there's a lot of mental clarity that comes with being in ketosis and burning fat and having ketones. That is the benefit with mental health. But it also has sort of like that spiritual component or mindful component of really looking at closely your relationship with food, what you're putting into your body, um, what your relationship is with like being uh, attuned to your hunger cues or your full cues and all of that. When you're fasting, it also gives you a break. It kind of gives you a break from having to obsess about, think about food all the time. It's cheaper and it is um, very simple, like you're not eating. So you're kind of being able to focus on other things without thinking about um, food all the time. So. I guess to I hope I have answered your question. I think there is a huge benefit that can be gained from intermittent fasting um, for mental health, not just on a, you know, like your, it does something for your brain chemistry due to the producing ketones, there's the weight loss. And, you know, there is having that mindfulness piece. So there's so many things that come with it. I would say um, intermittent fasting is definitely um, a fantastic uh, path for good mental health. And I would say that was a huge part of what prepared and kind of primed my body to actually go into the ketogenic diet and be able to sustain that as well. There is a certain level of simplicity and a certain level of um, ease that comes with fasting. But I would always, like I said, make sure that you are have some medical supervision and monitoring to make sure that you there's it's not going to be helpful. So, okay, perfect, good. Um, yeah. I wonder what kind of fasting you've been doing and for how long. 
said, uh, thank you. I have found it really helpful. Excellent. Yeah, I'm glad. I think it's uh, a simple strategy. It can be helpful, you know, with grocery bills being huge today, not to eat fewer calories, but, and it seems like it's counterintuitive, but um, I think it's um, a great way to go. Um, what else? I just, yes, I, I did OMAD for a little bit as well. Um, and that was probably um, the best one, uh, just because, like I said, it, it was, um, it gave me just so much time to focus on other things. And it was simple and straightforward. And um, I also did, and again, this is individual, and you want to do this. If you want to do this, this is up to you, but listen to your body. Once a month or a couple of times a month, I was doing 24 or 36 um, hour fasts as well. Hi, Stephanie. Um, and that was uh, also very helpful uh, just to have different periods where you do your fast every day or, you know, however many times you do it every week, but once um every now and then to do a little bit of longer fast. And I found that to be really helpful as well. Um, but OMAD stands for like one meal a day. And um, so you just basically do all your cal calories at the same time. And, and then you fast for the rest of the time you eat until you're satiated. And I think I love that part of it too, just being able to eat as much as you want until you're satiated when you're hungry, and then to just have that fasting period um, the rest of the time. Yeah, that's an excellent way to go. But if you're just, you know, starting out with intermittent fasting, you definitely want to go slow and start with something like I said, the 12 hour one, and then people move to um, what's called 16, eight, which is eight hours of eating window, 16 hour fast. And then you can increase and adjust it as, as you need. But yeah, I love I love fasting, and I would say that was one of the major simple interventions for mental health. Again, because it gets your body into ketosis, and you start burning ketones, which are fantastic for your brain. Similar to the ketogenic diet, that's what it does. It gets you into ketosis, and that's what's been helpful for people. There was a hundred years of there's a hundred years of research, by the way on the ketogenic diet and the ketones being really helpful. It was used for, um, the ketogenic diet was used for uh, treating, treatment of epilepsy with a 50% remission rate. And that's only just from anywhere from one to five years of implementing the diet, people basically went into remission. So now there is research coming out saying this benefit can actually extend to psychiatric conditions as well. Because if you think about it, even with people who are treated with epilepsy are treated with similar medications as people who are, have bipolar disorder. So those things share to some extent that um, sort of vulnerability of the brain. And if you're able to treat epilepsy with a ketogenic diet, then there might be implications on this as well. And that is many people are finding that out. Um, so Stephanie says, I'm doing a candida intestinal herbal general detox. Possible it was, it would help. Possible it was, okay. Um, possible, what, what do you mean possible, what would help? Can you clarify that question a little bit more? Um, so one, one thing I can say is that there's a huge connection between the gut and uh, mental health and general health as well. Huge connection. Um, yeah, Stephanie, I'm not sure what that question is. I know you said, you know, you're doing a herbal detox. 
and intestinal detox, and then what would, okay, 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 yes. Yeah, um, I would say both. I would say, you know, will will that detox help with mental health or general health or I'm trying to fix uh, leaky gut? Okay. I think anything that you do for the gut, um, in, you know, is going to be helpful for your general health for sure. And they say that, for example, when it comes to mental health, um, they say most of the serotonin that is produced is in our gut, not in our brain, as we might think. So the gut is actually, um, they it's called, it's labeled as the second brain. So anything that you do for your gut actually has a huge implication for physical health as well as mental health, I would say. Um, and I know that's been the case for me uh, when I started intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. I cut out sugar as minimal as much as possible, I, including, uh, by the way, fruits. So um, I've cut out gluten because I have sensitivity to that, dairy and processed foods. So my diet is mainly mostly meat and healthy fats and um, a few sort of fermented veggies because I really think that probiotics and prebiotics are going to be helpful. And that's been a huge help. So I'm not sure what you're doing in terms of herbal or general detox, even on a basic level, to be able to kind of cut out you know, just those things that are irritants to your body and not helpful to your gut is going to have, a, I think, a tremendous effect. So if you take care of the gut, that is just as good as taking care of your brain or your heart as well. Um, and I think many people experience um, challenges um, with all of these different things. Like, I don't know what, you know, people are sensitive to. But another, I think, issue that happens with medications, psychiatric medications, otherwise, any other medications, is it has an effect on your gut as well. A lot of people are not um, have problems with their gut because of everything that they put, not only, you know, like I said, the sugar and carbs and processed food and all that stuff. But if you're putting um, alcohol, for example, that's going to affect your gut. Uh, some people are even impacted by simple things like uh, Tylenol and Advil, if you're popping Tylenol and Advil all the time, that's going to have an impact on your gut. Um, what else? Obviously, substances and psychoactive, any substances like illicit substances, marijuana, alcohol, or these other things. But also, I think psychiatric medications. And um, another one I think that has a huge effect on the gut is the pill, like the hormonal birth control pill. So there are many things I think that are impacting our gut. And it is sort of that first place. Again, uh, like Dr. Georgia Eat said, the food that we put or the substances or ingredients that we put in our stomach is the first line of sort of the precursor for our body makeup and our brain chemicals and neurotransmitters. So I think taking care of your gut is huge. Um, absolutely. And, and the other piece I would say about the gut too is stress, because I have heard people have like ulcers from just stress. And stress is implicated in all of our, um, in I would say 90% of mental and physical illnesses, stress is a huge factor. And many people when they have tremendous amount of stress, even will have end up having a hole in their stomach, like a literal hole in your stomach from stress. So, you know, <laughs> the interesting thing, if you look at it from a bigger perspective and a spiritual perspective about when people say, you know, I have a gut feeling, um, your gut is just like I said, your second brain. And it kind of lets you know what's going on. It gives you signals and it gives us feedback. Um, the same with sort of like your elimination, uh, that process. So 
all of that is sort of an indication for you and a feedback from your body, letting you know what's working and what's not working. So if your gut is not happy and it's kind of giving you different messages saying, hey, something needs to change. And um, it is that place where that's where the nourishment takes place. And that's where, um, yeah, it's the gut is huge. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your feedback. Um, just your channel is wonderful. Well, I'm, yeah, I hope it is uh, helpful. And, you know, I want to share my experiences in the hope that people um, are encouraged and inspired. Um, because I went through this process in my journey where I felt so hopeless at times. And I didn't know what was working, what was not working. And I tried so many different things and medications weren't helpful. And I really struggled a lot. And I know I'm not the only person that has health challenges and had mental health challenges and then gone through the mental health system and not found the things that were offered very helpful. And so I wanted to come online. I'm actually a pretty um, private person and an introvert. So this is all kind of um, <laughs> uncomfortable and for me, but I feel I have found something that made such a huge difference for me that I want to be able to share that with people. And hopefully that that would be um, something that is going to help you in your own journey to feel better and to be healthy. Um, one of this one, one of my favorite sayings is a person who is healthy has a thousand dreams and a person who is not healthy only has one dream, which is to feel better. And so I think we all want to feel better. And oh, thank you so much. You're so kind. Um, I really appreciate your feedback. And I think that's what kind of keeps me going as well is that if this is something that's helpful for people then i want to continue uh sharing and um my experiences and knowledge um yeah it was it was a, a lengthy process for me it was a seven year a seven year journey for me to start implementing um proper sleep protocol you know get rid of uh, birth control pill, um, give up shift work. There were so many things that I implemented, but I would say, and all of them were helpful and kind of came together. And, but I, at the end of the day, one of the two major things that really helped was the intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. Um, yeah, for sure. I would say when I first came into the ketogenic carnivore, uh, community and started reading Dr. Palmer's work, Dr. Eid's work, Metabolic Mind channel, and the Bible cast um, interviews and all of those, it was really helpful. I think that was the first time that I thought to myself, there was a possibility of healing, like mental illness, because from my education as a psych nurse, my, my work experience, I was always it was always thought, and that is the narrative in psychiatry, that mental illness is incurable, it's lifelong, you have to be on these medications for life. Hearing someone else's story of putting, you know, their bipolar in remission or schizoaffective disorder in, in remission or schizophrenia in remission was just like completely unheard of. And I thought, wow, okay, so maybe the way I was thinking about mental illness or health in general and or nutrition, what I've been taught and what's in the mainstream narrative was wrong. And so, but having other people's stories, I think stories heal um, and stories give us hope and especially a lived experience um, is huge. So I'm, I am happy to pay that forward and share my story with, you know, other people, anyone, um, so if it gives them hope and encouragement, then that's, that's worth it. Do you think, um, 
Rainbow Sky123 asks, do you think there is a link between anemia and mental health? I would say um, I know that iron deficiency, which is anemia, can create a lot of issues for people. One, um, it's a required thing for that needs to kind of be in your blood. And your blood obviously goes throughout your body and nourishes every part of our bodies. And so deficiency in iron usually ends up having, uh, people will end up having huge energy issues. Um, and it definitely affects your mental health. Like if you're fatigued all the time, uh, your concentration will be off as well. Um, so nutritional deficiencies in general will have an impact, um, whether that's, you know, vitamin D or iron or magnesium or uh, B12, for example. So I would say iron is pretty important because it deals with um, your blood, which is something that nourishes and supports pretty much every aspect of your body. And that's how nutrients are transported within our bodies. And so I would say, you know, most people will ask about supplementation when they're in, um, whatchamacallit, uh, when they're doing, say, metabolic therapies and ketogenic diet and nutritional stuff for uh, their bodies. And most of the time, you should be able to get most of your nutrition if you're eating healthy and whole foods from your food. But if there are deficiencies, definitely you want to get blood work done before you implement any of this. And if there's deficiencies in vitamin D or iron or B12, those are like, or folate, very critical um, nutritional sort of um, ingredients um, that you don't want to miss. So you may need to supplement those. Um, but iron is a big one, I would say. Um, that you want to address. Um, is that something that you, um, Rainbow Sky, is that something you have um, dealt with or what has been your experience in terms of um, anemia and mental health issues? I'm curious. Um, I know that uh, my mom had um, issues with anemia when I was growing up, and there was definitely uh, some concerns around her energy. I think when you don't have a lot of energy, then you're kind of limited in how much you can do. There's some, I think it impacts your mood as well. Um, and your your mental clarity and all of those things. So I think definitely there's there's some link in there. Um, what I find interesting is we want to have a specific sort of like a pat answer to what kind of causes mental health and or mental illness or imbalance, if you think about it. But there's such, and, and nutritional deficiencies actually is a huge area where people are misdiagnosed. They may have just a simple nutritional deficiency that needs to be treated. And many people end up being misdiagnosed with mental illness and being put on medications. Whereas if it was taken time to just address the nutritional deficiencies that could actually be resolved. Again, this is one area where people completely dismiss diet with physical health and with mental health. Um, that's one thing that just blows my mind because many people will go to clinicians with various problems and it's rarely, they're rarely told, for example, oh, can you go ahead and keep a journal of what you eat and bring it back? Let's see, you know, how much sugar, like simply just even having lots of sugar for, especially for kids that could have implications with like um, 
various illnesses. And so that's, I'm glad that you asked that question about anemia or just, you know, iron deficiency, because I also think that uh, diet and nutrition is very much dismissed and not really taken as a huge factor to look at as a cause of physical or mental imbalances. And so many people, if they were to be taken through the process of actually really understanding their body, understanding how their brain works, understanding how nutrition works to affect them in a positive or negative way, and help through that process to implement and find and tweak what works for you, then I think there, there's a huge prevention of illness and imbalance that could be sorted out before rushing into diagnosing and, and medicating people, whether that's for a physical illness or a mental illness. Um, so Stephanie says, we're so unhealthy here, processed foods, GMO, et cetera. I don't think you can have good mental health without solid physical health. Well, yes, both of these are interconnected. And I think that's, that's huge. Um, you can't separate them. Uh, that's what Chris Palmer talks about, for example, in his book. He says metabolic health or physical health, if you think about it, is absolutely interconnected with mental health. You cannot separate the two. And spiritual health, which is completely cut off in medicine and psychiatry. And I'm not talking about a specific religion per se. It's whatever that means to you for uh, whatever spirituality means to you and however you define it. Those two, we experience life in all of three levels, physical, mental, and spiritual. And you cannot, all of those are integrated in a human being. They're not separated. So your physical health, your mental health, your relationships, your financial health, your um, work, career, all of this is interconnected. None of it just exists on its own. So to me, to just dismiss one thing or another without really paying attention, looking at it from all perspectives, that is disempowering for people, especially something like sleep and food that you are having to deal with on a daily basis. It is something that impacts your health greatly. And yeah, absolutely. It's a holistic, comprehensive approach is what people need. Um, and being able to look at their life experiences from all sides. And that's being respectful of a whole, the whole person. Person is not just a sum total of their body or brain chemicals. They're more than that. They're a spiritual being, a, a human being, a mental, physical, like emotional being. Um, they're connected to their families and relationships and communities. And so in order to address some imbalance, you have to look at it from all sides. And the other pieces um, in this is that most of the time, Western medicine and psychiatry look at the illness or imbalance just originating in the individual, in just one person. But the truth of it is, you we all come out of family dynamics, intergenerational patterns and dynamics. We come out of communities. We come out of countries and a whole, like, the whole world. We're not just existing as an island. So if there's imbalance in the individual, that means there is imbalance in the family. That means there's imbalance in the community. And that's an indigenous teaching where it's more holistic that illness and imbalance doesn't exist on its own. And if you're going to address the issue, it's not just the individual you have to address it with. You have to address it from a bigger perspective and the wider circles as well. Oh my goodness, psychiatrist. <laughs> um, Stephanie says, I've never once heard any of this from a psychiatrist. Well, I've had a share of working with many psychiatrists the past 17 years. And they, most of them are, they don't have the time. And, and it's not an excuse. This is not what I'm saying. Um, they see people for 10, 15 minutes, hand them prescriptions. The first time they meet someone, they might do an assessment for half, you know, 45 minutes, an hour, and you still end up with um, a prescription and a diagnosis. That's not adequate time. 
And or if you go see a family doctor, they have 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That is not adequate time to look at all aspects of this person and really understand the underlying dynamic and issues that are impacting them. Um, for sure, you get trauma as a child from trauma-based parents. Oh, absolutely. Uh, trauma is a huge one, intergenerational trauma especially. I think we all have it. You just look back at the human history. The number one cause of um, violence in the world is not war. It's domestic violence. It's people who are being abused by someone who's close to them, like an intimate partner violence. Um, childhood abuse is huge. Uh, physical, verbal, sexual abuse, and um, really very dysfunctional patterns, whether it's addiction or all kinds of them that come out of families. And um, the BC Women's Hospital, they did a study um, a few years back, and they basically, their preliminary uh, research results were that trauma precedes mental health and addictions issues. And then there's other studies like the ACE studies as well that were done before that if you've had childhood abuse, if you've had childhood adversity, that those things are going to have huge implication for your mental health. It doesn't mean you're held hostage by the trauma. I actually just recorded an episode yesterday. I'll be posting in the next couple of days uh, talking about the impact of trauma and on mental health. It's a huge piece. I would say many of, if not 100% of the clients that I've worked with over the years um, who are struggling with mental health and addictions issues have a significant history of trauma, not just a little bit like, you know, everybody gets a share, but some people have significant history that has impaired and impacts their functioning. And that's another thing that um, was just very recently started to be looked at. There's not that we still have a lot to learn around this, but no one has the time to really sit down, um, it seems like, to acknowledge and understand those family dynamics and those issues because nobody wants to talk about these things. They're uncomfortable. They, um, you know, who wants to talk about sex trafficking or physical abuse or sexual abuse or that our communities or people in our communities are, th these things are happening to people every day. And there's shame around it. And it's also messy. It's a messy topic. And, you know, I personally have, uh, in my channel, I share about intergenerational trauma and trauma that I experienced as a child and how that affected me. And it's not just childhood trauma, by the way. We experience different types of traumas along the way. None of us are shielded from that. Um, you know, most people, when they think about trauma, we're talking about childhood trauma, but there's people who experience sexual trauma, sexual harassment. There's people who go to war for a couple of years and have PTSD. Um, there is grief and loss that we all go through as part of being human beings, you know, somebody dying or a breakup of a major connection or relationship, none of us are immune or sheltered from grief and loss and trauma. And that is not something that's going to be fixed by medication. In fact, medications a lot of the times numb people's feelings and they don't connect with that, that trauma, whether it's from childhood or along the way in your life, and to actually be supported to work through that process instead of just saying, hey, here, Here's the medication you can, you know, detach from that grief and trauma and just move forward. It doesn't work that way. That's one area that is really kind of neglected in a way, not acknowledged, and people are not given the tools to really work through. And medications, I think they are absolutely wrong in those situations. I think there are situations where medications should not be prescribed. Earlier, we mentioned about the nutritional deficiencies that can be simply addressed. And trauma is another major area that affects a person's mental health. And most of the time, people are not supported in that process, acknowledged, validated, and supported. And even the trauma of navigating the mental health system and the trauma of like being on litany of medications and tried on this and it did, this didn't work and the loss that comes from that and the stigma and the isolation. That's another area where 
it really um, upsets me to think about it because there's so much injury that happens to people and it is dismissed, not validated. Some people are actually absolutely gaslighted in that process and then discarded to just deal with this on their own. And so I feel, yeah, somebody was saying, Megan says that unfortunately psychiatry at times causes trauma as was my case, uh, emotionally blunted. Yeah, there's many injuries that people experience in psychiatry um, that the impact of the effect of medications being one, but it's also, they're also not addressing the underlying issues. So you still have the problems that you started with, and now you have another layer of problems because these medications create a huge issue with weight gain and brain fog and sexual dysfunction and so that's traumatic for people. That's like insult to injury. Not only you don't have the underlying issues that you came with acknowledged and properly addressed from all perspectives, physically, mentally, emotionally, in every way, but then you also now have to contend with these medications not giving you unwanted effects. And then you're not helped to properly deprescribe or safely taper. The only solution that you get when you go there, when you go back to the clinician is it's, hey, here is more medications. Let's up this dose. Let's bring this down, add this medication. I've seen people on 12 different medications, 13, 10 different medications. And it's like their functioning and their quality of life is shit. And then it's just like they're, sorry for the whole language. Um, and uh, and then they're just struggling and just languishing through the system and in their lives, you know. It's really tough for people. And it's hard to watch them in this way when there are so many things that could be implemented and they can be helped to feel better and move forward in their lives. Um, I, I just find it really tough. And that was one of the reasons why I really struggled throughout my career because I thought, well, I became a nurse because I want to help people, not to witness them just in needless suffering. And at some point, people people give up hope, you know, um, because they're like, okay, what is what is my choice here? I'm just going to be in this revolver, revolving door syn uh, syndrome of like hospitalization and litany of medications try this and come off of that and then they're they're not functioning in their lives and their quality of life and their function is not great and so you get to this place of thinking okay is this my life is this how it's going to be for the rest of my life and what do I do now I mean I was and and people do consider suicide some people will consider suicide and I don't think that is um it's, I think, to some extent, understandable when you have to live with unrelenting pain and suffering. And it's not, I don't think people, in my experience, I have done suicide risk assessments and spoken with people who really struggled with it for years. That was a main part of my job. And people don't want to die. They really, I think, our intuitive feeling around death is that we want to live, but we also don't want to suffer as human beings, especially a suffering that just keeps going on and on and on. And there is no, um, yeah, there's a lot of stigma attached to in terms of mental illness as well as suicide. But the truth of it is, it's not unlike a human being to consider that after they've been suffering for so long. And that desire is not the desire to really die most of the time. It is really just to end suffering. I don't want to live in unrelenting suffering for years with no solutions, with nothing getting better. And I am amazed how long people hold on to hope despite significant suffering, not only in their childhood, not only in their adult years, through the mental health system, and they still keep going on, they still hold on, and they want to find solutions. So I've been, a, you know, I feel really incredibly privileged to have had 
the opportunity to work with the population of people I worked with because I think they're one of the most vulnerable, but one of the strongest people as well because they've endured so much pain and so much suffering. And then not only in their own lives, but now navigating through a system that doesn't have, that has one size fit all solutions and being able to, and still trying to find solutions. And so I feel like people are incredibly courageous, incredibly strong and resilient. And I feel truly blessed to have had this opportunity to work with people over the years and even the work I do today. Um, I'm absolutely amazed. And in terms of suicide, I know it's heartbreaking. I did a video on my channel uh, called The Anatomy of Suicide. Um, it's not something to be pathologized. Like, obviously, I've always supported life. I want people to live and feel better and get relief and move forward in their lives. But the truth of it is, as human beings, I've had that experience of being suicidal. And it was directly connected to the medications and also my experience of going through the mental health system. Because previous to that, it was never in my radar. It was never an option because I just never even thought about it. And then my first year treatment with antidepressants, six, first of all, within two or three weeks, I went manic. And then six months later, after I tapered off medication, I had to go back on medication and I was suicidal from the withdrawal of the antidepressant. So to me, um, I don't necessarily pathologize suicide. I try to understand it. And there is tremendous amount of isolation tremendous amount of shame, loneliness, and just this place of not having hope. That's where people are at when they're considering suicide as an option. It's a place where people feel there is, I don't know what to do, nothing is working, and I don't want to continue to suffer day in and day out. And, and then, Absolutely, there is a tremendous amount of loneliness and isolation and um, and suicide. And what's what was really disheartening for me was when I worked in emergency, um, children's emergency, kids were coming in with their parents every day. And I would say about 90% of those kids, their presentation was had a suicidal ideation feature. I've seen kids. Um, so and the parents are completely bewildered. And so you think, why are our kids considering suicide as an option? Like, why is this, how are things for them so bad that they are thinking about suicide and planning and attempting and some completing and I've seen all of it. And so to me, this is part of something that was mismanaged. It's not about blame, but if things were addressed from the beginning, you know, the education piece on nutrition, the education piece on mental illness, domestic violence, uh, trauma, all of these things, and people are helped along the way to address all of that, then you don't come into a head to this place of like just utter hopelessness and darkness and consider that, you know what, this is just not worth it. So to me, there's just a ton of things that can be done along the way to help people, to take control of their mental health, to take control of their lives, to address, you know, the underlying issues that they have and to be supported in that process. And if they're thinking suicide, you need to have that conversation with them and explore the meaning of life and death. And that's another thing that we avoid in Western medicine and psychiatry. You just don't want to face that topic of spirituality about life and death head on without pathologizing it, without making it wrong, without st stigmatizing it. You have to consider your, we have to consider our life and death. We do every day. And considering death actually makes you appreciate life. It makes you realize the preciousness of life. And we people need to understand that to be able to make sense of their lives and make sense of their being. Because whether you like it or not, people will have 
if they're struggling and suffering, uh, like I said, without relief, unrelenting pain and suffering for long, they are going to think about those things. And so it's important to have that conversation without shaming or blaming or making it wrong so that they can get to a place where they can get some support. Um, GC8118 said, Dr. Peter Brigan and the book called Anatomy of Epidemic were highly informative in my journey of psychiatry. Yes, um, both of them fantastic um, authors and advocates for, you know, um, compassionate treatment of people with mental illness without just pathologizing and medicalizing and drugging and numbing people. Absolutely, they those works are pivotal, I think, in the process of change in psychiatry and people taking charge of their mental health. <clears throat> oh yeah, there's many people um, I've come across over the years. Um, James Davies is another one. He has really amazing books. Um, and David Healy, um, there is um, Dr. Yosef who does, who runs the Taper Clinic, fantastic resources. Like there's so many um, resources out there today. People are just demanding something more or something better. People are tired of just um, being offered this one thing that doesn't even work. Yeah, medication and therapy. Everybody says medication and therapy. Yes, they have their own place and they can be helpful, but they don't work for everybody. And as I always say, there's a thousand paths to healing, not just one, not just two. And all avenues of healing need to be explored. And there's also some dark things around like the history of psychiatry and and how things are done even to this day that are very questionable and that do not work for people. In fact, I think they harm people. And I think these uh, authors like David, uh, Dr. Brigan and David Healy and Dr. Joseph with the Taper Clinic, um, all of those people and, and then the meta metabolic therapies and ketogenic diets community, they're coming on board saying, hey, you know what? We have better solutions. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> um, GC18 says everything you're saying resonates. I hope so, um, because I I believe people deserve to be treated with respect and dignity, and they need to have all avenues of healing explored with them and given an opportunity to be listened to, heard. And when they come back and say, hey, this treatment is not working for me, they need to be listened to. And they also need to have the support they need to make sense of their lives, meaning out of their suffering. And if their suffering can be helped, they need to be helped, of course, that's the best thing to do. But, and if not, there's also a way to preserve a person's dignity in their suffering. But there is, when it comes to mental health and or physical health or health in general, there is so much that can be done to help people that can, that doesn't involve surgery or that doesn't involve even medications for that matter. Absolutely. Um, I think people feel not confident in their own intuition and their own lived experiences and their own because they are interfacing with a doctor that has gone to school for eight years or 13 years, a psychiatrist or whatever. But the truth of it is you have, you're the authority in your own body. You're the authority in your own lived experience. You're the authority in your body's feedback. And so what you have to say and share with your clinicians is important and they need to take time to listen, validate, and collaborate with you in trying to find solutions and not just being dismissive and telling you, you know, treating you like everyone else. There, that's not, that's not fair, that's not respectful. And many a times people are not given adequate time to be heard, to be listened to, to be understood. That in and of itself is actually healing for people. That's like 80% of the game there is just 
having that sacred space for a person to explore what's going on for them. And they usually have their solutions. You don't even have to come up with a solution because they are aware of what is going to help. They just need someone to hold space for them. As yes, as a medic, I listen to my patients. They live in their body, not me. Very important. Yeah, absolutely. And they have resources and they're resilient and they're strong. And if you treat them as such, then they will find the solution. Sometimes people just need a little encouragement and support. And yes, there are things that can be offered from an expert point of view, but um, Okay. I worked out gluten effects of mental health and arthritis. Yeah. A lot of people are sensitive to uh, gluten and um, sugar and carbs and um, uh, dairy as well for some people, for sure. I, I noticed a huge difference as well with my mood, with uh, my energy, when I cut out uh, gluten. And for arthritis as well, I've heard that from other people. Actually, um, there is a Jordan Peterson's uh, daughter had terrible arthritis, um, had had many surgeries. She shares her story around. Um, she talks specifically about the elimination diet, which is a carnivore. But that is one of the things that really tremendously improved for her was um, her arthritis. I believe her name is Michaela Peterson. Yeah. Um, so I, um, is there any more questions from everything that we've discussed? Um, how is this going for you guys so far? Um, and also the other thing I want to ask, so I was thinking that I want to cover topics on this, on the live stream. So I'm planning to do them every week at the same time. And I was thinking of doing, um, covering psychiatric medications and tapering, um, sort of like the main themes, which is the same as on my channel, uh, ketogenic diet and metabolic therapies. Um, and then also, the other area I want to cover is trauma, specifically intergenerational trauma and recovery from trauma. And then the other one I want to focus on is mindset in terms of, um, I talk about the teachings of uh, Neville Goddard. So I really think that the way we think and our attitude has a huge impact on our mental health. And so that's kind of what CBT is based on, really thinking about your thoughts, emotions, and behavior. So those are kind of the four major areas that I want to cover. Um, so I'm wondering if there is anything specific other than that that you would like me to research or cover with you guys on the live stream. So um, GC18 says, um, are there specific things that you've seen to help those with chemical injury? At least that's what it feels like after a bad withdrawal years ago. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I would say a lot of the times, uh, time is what you need to heal. But everything else, like I've talked about, um, metabolic therapies, proper sleep schedule, proper diet, uh, lowering your stress, essentially creating as much of the conditions that would be ideal for your body to thrive and to heal um, would be helpful. But I think the bigger, um, and, and to mitigate sort of that impact. So I think that's what re is really needed. I don't think there's like a quick fix. A lot of the times people are saying, you know, I've had this withdrawal symptom for years and injury and the symptoms haven't abated, even though I've stopped the medication, like in the case of protracted withdrawal um, and chemical injury. And I think the body is incredibly resilient. So I would, I would not give up in terms of like, just continuing to nurture your body and mind in every way possible, as much as you can. And 
there may be some uh, people in some areas that the damage can be long lasting, and I hope that's not the case. But um, and in those situations, it's basically having to live with just like somebody has a chronic pain, they have to manage it somehow and live with it. And that is the unfortunate thing that I think that's heartbreaking to think about because people weren't completely 100% informed of, like I said in the beginning, the ramifications of their their choices in terms of getting on medication that they should have been told in the beginning, hey, you're going to have an injury if you went in the tapering process or that these medications might have long-term irreversible damage. And those are the things that are not people are not told. Like in the case of PSSD, um, long-term sexual dysfunction or um, tardive dyskinesia, or even the injury that people experience from tapering, like these are not, you know, discussed with people from the get-go. And people discover after being on this medication for five, 10, 15 years, they're going to try to come off of it. One, it's going to be a horrific experience as you go through it for some majority of people, many people. And then there are, nobody has told them that, hey, by the way, some of these are going to be long term. And so to me, the healing piece, if it's going to heal, you provide your body with as much support and nurturing as you can. And that could be helpful. And in some minor cases, there might be some things that are going to be long lasting or that you struggle with for a lengthy period of time, unfortunately. And uh, so that's that's really tough. Um, and yeah, I, I wish there was more answers or a, a specific thing I can tell you that it's going to help. But I would say do everything that you know how to do to nurture and provide the condition of healing for your body. And hopefully that is going to be helpful. Um, I hope that answers your question. Oh, yeah, like I said, you know, there's detox, nutritional supplements, the, you know, the fundamentals of sleep, lowering stress, um, certain supplements, for example, uh, NAC can be helpful with detox. Or um, so there's so many different things that can be explored, hopefully to help those situations. And I think most of them will heal with time. And because our bodies and our brains are pretty incredibly resilient. And so I don't want people to give up hope, you know, oh, my gosh, I, I now have this, you know, permanent thing. But even in those situations, there's lots that can be done to help the person cope and manage and live a productive, meaningful, um, healthy life. So nothing is, you know, nothing is impossible. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that things are getting better. And I think, you know, it sounds like you've done a lot of work already. And hopefully, you know, the the worst parts have kind of passed on and you can move forward creating, um, feeling better. Yeah, definitely. We Can we talk about the various side effects? Yeah, we can do that. Do you guys have any more suggestions of what you might want to see covered on um, on this on the live streams? Is providing okay? Yeah, I think that's a tough thing for people to when they discover that they're going through this process and they, you know, reduce their medication or stop and then sort of like the heroin journey that they have to go through with medication tapering and then the aftermath of the, you know, either the injury from the medications as well as the tapering process. And many people are not helped to deprescribe and taper safely in the system. So they're pretty much on their own when they decide they're going to stop. And in fact, 
every day I hear from people that I work with, they come in and they say, well, my doctor told me to half the dose of, you know, the benzos that I was taking for the, you know, for the past five years or 10 years, or any other psychiatric medication to go 50% on the dose for a couple of weeks, and then 25% for one week, and then be done with it, like within two to four weeks. And that is like a recipe for injury and, and harm. And people are not told and supported in that deprescribing process. In fact, then when they destabilize, they're then told, oh, this is the relapse of your symptom. You're going to need more medication or they get a new diagnosis, multiple medications. And it's really tough. It's rough on your brain and your body. Um, Stephanie asked, your experience with patients, did you find most to be violent as society thinks or just wanting to talk? That was my experience yeah. Um, yeah, uh, George Louis, uh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, no, I, I have never felt threatened. Like I have always felt safe, even working in acute care in an emergency. I've never had any issues with people being, you know, there are times when people are agitated because they're on substances or they're very upset with whatever is going on for them. And, um, but that's kind of a minor thing. Most people who are struggling with mental health and addictions issues are just, yeah, wanting to talk, wanting to find solutions, desperate to find solutions and wanting to just figure out a way to move forward in their lives. Um, I have never felt threatened in my line of work. Like I said, there's been situations where it involved handling a certain level of crisis and aggression, uh, but those were often actually related to substance misuse a lot of the times and, um, and very frustrating situations as well for everyone involved. Um, <clears throat> A question, uh, what would recommend, what would you recommend to a person who is discontinuing antidepressant medication and also has address, has to address chronography consumption, oh, chronography consumptions, habits characterized by physical dependence? Sorry, is that, okay. Um, Okay. I so addiction is I mean you're looking at a person who has like the discontinuing the antidepressant there might be some uh dependency has developed and so they're going to go through some withdrawal and physical dependence as well. Um so it's kind of a a similar boat on each cases um with addiction dependency and addiction, those are two separate things. Dependency with antidepressant use, it's not necessarily addiction. The person is not abusing the medication, but their brain has gotten used to it. Whereas um, if we're talking about uh, other types of addiction, that is a separate thing because there is usually abuse and misuse. Whereas with prescribed medications, people are taking their medication as prescribed, but their body and their brain gets used to it. So in both of these cases, though, it is something that has to be addressed in a way that's going to be safe and sustainable. Um, with the medications, as always, slow tapering. Um, the recommended tapering pace is about 5 to 10% of the medication every 30 days. And for some people, it might be slow, or some people can go a little faster. Uh, but I would say the slower you go, the the safest. In terms of addressing addiction of any kind, uh, the first step is always um, acknowledging that there's a problem and that is something that you want to change. And um, getting as much support as possible. It's the same with tapering, but in both cases, you want to get as much support as you can um, with being able to have accountability and you're going to have 
in the case of addiction, you're going to have cravings, you're going to have relapses, you're going to take a step back. And so you want someone to be there to really support you in that process. Yeah, so you're not alone either way, whether it's, you know, with the antidepressant or um, whatever is going on for you, um, any other addictions that you're struggling with, you, you can overcome it. It's just a matter of taking slow steps and addressing also the underlying issues. So another thing I want to mention with addiction specifically, underneath addiction is always some sort of trauma. So you want to address where did this start for you? What were the factors that influenced you to start medicating? Whether that is uh, substances or porn or whatever it is, people medicate or food for some people. You want to address the underlying trauma and the underlying issues. Okay, I'm currently about 25 days abstinent from. Wonderful. That's fantastic. Like you're doing, you're doing good. Keep going and get as much support as you can for yourself moving forward. Um, can we discuss the best way to get your psychiatrist to listen to new findings and look into new diagnoses? Oh, wow. I wish I had the answer to that. And uh, <laughs> good luck. No, I'm just joking. Um, I think, you know, a lot of psychiatrists have just um, kind of bought into the system what they've been taught. But I think there's also a lot of psychiatrists who would be willing and open to listen. Um, and and so I think you have to advocate for yourself and insist that you this is a collaborative relationship that you have with your clinician and that they can't just be it, like any relationship, it's a give and take. And so if you're doing the research and bringing information to them, they should at least consider that. If not, I know it's hard nowadays to find uh, psychiatrists and doctors because of shortages. So I would look for another one who would be willing to be open and listen. And if you're not in that position, though, that's what makes it really challenging and difficult for people because they don't have the cooperation and collaborative relationship with their clinician. They're dismissive. They are not willing to listen or look at information. So that makes it really difficult. Um, yeah, <laughs> some, but I have come across, you know, another thing I want to mention to you is that if you have an opportunity to work with nurse practitioners specifically, that could be helpful. They seem to be more open to alternative and complementary suggestions and ideas, whereas psychiatrists seem to be like they don't have the time to really, and or that they are not you know, if you're thinking ketogenic diet, metabolic therapies, or like some herbal detox or supplements or just anything else, they're more like medication is the answer. And if you don't want, and I've also seen psychiatrists basically dismiss a kid because they can't prescribe to them anymore or an adult. Um, they're there, their role is pretty rigid for the most part. Not that they don't have the option to practice other ways. You know, you look at Dr. Georgia E, Dr. Chris Palmer, and all these people that are in the in these communities now, they're willing to look at alternatives. So there are people out there, I think, that are willing to, but it is um, that is a tough one for a lot of people because many of them are kind of set in their ways and don't want to question the status quo. We need an online clinical and some oh some MDs are doing, but for psychiatry. Okay. Oh, clinics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, when it comes to medical and psychiatric mental health professionals, um, some are open and willing to look at things and other others are not. And you have to hopefully find someone that would be willing to collaborate with you and listen to you and, you know, support you in that process. And if you can find um, that person, that's huge. Um, but for some people I know, they feel kind of stuck. Um, I was lucky that I had a clinician that was very supportive. I also, there's also another thing I want to mention, if you're living in Canada, uh, Shoppers has a program, um, at least in Nova Scotia, that's where I was at the time when I 
um, connected with a pharmacist, they have a program that's covered through the MSI that um, allows you to get tapering support from a pharmacist, which is fantastic. So there's some resources that you can look into uh, that could be helpful in your, in your journey. Uh, yeah, Stephanie says, I'll not go near a psychiatrist anymore, anymore, too traumatic. Yeah, that is also really sad for people where they go, you know, they seek help, and then the help is not there. And in fact, it's been harmful, the interactions are not supportive, they're short, quick, they're, you know, because of um, people just having a huge amount of caseload and a lot of having to see so many people in a run of a day, like physicians seeing 40, you know, 30, 40 people in a day, you really, that is the issue with Western medicine and psychiatry. People just are not given adequate time. And I, I do feel for the professionals to some extent because they're working in that system as well. And I was there too, and it was it's very frustrating. I think many people go into the medical and psychiatric profession wanting to be supportive and help people, but the system, the way it's set up, it's not conducive to that type of support. And there's just a huge amount of paperwork and a huge amount of like, just the way it's structured, it's not helpful. So even though some clinicians might have the good intention to want to do a good job, um, the way things are set up right now, it's not really. Um, oh, yeah, the full moon. <laughs> yeah, it's a full moon today. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could say more about, you know, astrology, but I don't have a very good knowledge around that. Uh, but I know that I'm usually very much aware when the full moon comes up or the new moon comes up. And um, when I was working in Emerge, um, people, you definitely noticed like a shift in the energy um, in those, you know, a couple of days before the full moon or a couple of days after. And this is something I'm sure Stephanie can relate to this, that um, people mention about um, kind of how chaotic things can be sometimes around those times. So I find that really fascinating. I, and Stephanie says, I found the system to be punitive. Yes, it's it's a bit paternalistic. It's punitive. Um, and uh, people are, to some extent, not given a lot of due for their lived experience and their own expertise in their bodies and told what to do and kind of uh, dismissed in their, you know, what they're saying sometimes when they come back and they say, hey, this treatment is not working for me. It's not helpful. Okay, so Megan says, full moon is when your wish. Um, let me see. Something about your wish on the new moon come to fruition. I, for some reason, I'm not seeing that. Um, okay. Interesting. I've heard also um, about the full moon that um, it's about endings uh, and new beginnings. So that's kind of how I... I look at it. Um, what would be a, always an interesting question is um, if the full moon has an impact on mental health. Megan says, study the astrology. That's cool. <clears throat> full moon is when your wishes on the new moon come to fruition. Beautiful. Any other questions right now? Like, um, and and thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I think this was really, um, I was a little nervous about doing the first live stream. And this has been really a pleasant experience. I actually prefer it to uh, just sitting down and recording a video. This feels just a bit more interactive. And I like the idea of just being able to answer questions and kind of have this conversation with you guys. Um, 
live. So I'm definitely going to schedule another one. Um, and you're more than welcome to let me know what topics, like I said, I have those four major area of topics that I want to cover, but if there's specific things that you would want, just leave me a message on, um, this video is going to be posted. So I'll be able to, um, any feedback that you have, any topics you want to cover it, I'll be able to do that. Also, is the time good? I, I was thinking of like 9 uh, a.m. Pacific, but I just decided to do it 8 o'clock because I know mo for most people in their time zones, it's going to be a little bit later in the morning. Um, so I'm wondering if this time still is a good one or do you guys have any suggestions in terms of, and I also figured Sundays would be a good day to do it because most people have Sundays off. Okay, yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, all right. So any other questions right now or? Oh, no worries. I think you're doing pretty good with your English, George. Um, <laughs> the cleaning can always wait, hey? Yeah, I mean, cleaning can be pretty therapeutic too, but I can I can see myself like just procrastinating for a bit as well with that. Yeah. Um, George, where are you from? Or like what other language do you speak? Yeah, I wonder if everybody could type like where they're um, tuning in from. I just want to kind of see where everyone is located. I am in um, British Columbia currently in Canada. So, oh, nice. <laughs> Okay, Megan, I'm from South Africa. That's cool. All right. I, I'm originally from Ethiopia. I would love to visit South Africa someday. Pennsylvania. Okay, Amish country. <clears throat> All right. Have you seen any miracle during your time as a nurse? <clears throat> okay um it's i don't know how you define a miracle or what you mean by that i mean there's different types of like you know what you call divine interventions and miracles and it can be simple things as well um but yeah, that's an interesting question there. I'm not sure how to answer it, but I would say um, it's kind of funny. One of my uh, favorite quotes from Einstein is that you can look at life as if everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle and doesn't mean anything. So to me, um, I think there's so many miracles that happen every single day, not just as a nurse, as a human being that we all get to witness. And how we define that miracle or define divine intervention can mean anything. Um, but, you know, I've heard of stories of people that have, would, were pronounced dead and come back to life. I consider my own journey of reversing antidepressant induced uh, bipolar disorder, which in the traditional system are told that that's not, um, you know, possible that's a miracle but also just simple little things you know people being helped um changing their minds i've seen one thing i constantly witnessed um in my career as a nurse i would say i was going to consider a miracle is somebody who attempts suicide and doesn't make it through and and then they have this huge shift of their thinking and understanding about life and about the connections that they have and how it impacted their families. Um, and I would say when someone has come ha has come to us, uh, especially kids, um, highly, you know, overdose and terrible medications and 
uh, they, we think, I think they're not going to make it. And they still end up making it through and surviving that experience um, is a miracle. But it doesn't have to be anything like hugely drastic as well. There are simple little things that happen in life that I think are miraculous. But even just the fact that we're here on this, <laughs> having this conversation online from all different parts of the world i think that's amazing um just even the gift of life like if you woke up every today and you are breathing and you're somewhat in okay shape you know your body is functioning to the best it can that's a miracle because there are millions of people that will not see today that would have thought like they have guaranteed their life today but nobody has that so um or even the fact that we don't have to consciously manage our heart's beating or our breathing. How many of us can sustain that if we had to consciously decide to do those things? So I look at life and, and how it's constructed and our bodies and our brains and the time that we're living at and the technologies and conveniences that we have. And all of it is pretty miraculous. And if you're in the part of the world where there's peace and you know, order and you're able to go to school, live your life in whatever way. Um, that's something to be grateful for because not everybody has that in our world today. Or even health, you know, for various reasons, not just mental health or physical health, our bodies, people struggle with various conditions and problems and issues with their body. So a functioning body, a well working body is pretty miraculous. Um, so I would say, have I seen any miracles during my time as a nurse and as a human being? Yes, many, many, many. I don't think it's, I would have the time to really list everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think everyone's definition of miracle is different. But um, I tend to think about if you just look at life and our existence and what we've been able to accomplish individually and collectively, um, just this experience itself, I think, is pretty incredible, uh, pretty miraculous. Even the, the, you know, when I look back in my life, I look back at even the most devastating things that I've gone through, the most challenging things I've gone through, and they're still um and, and being able to survive that and come out of it and be in a state of thriving, all of it was interesting and adventure an adventure and all of it, some of it was miraculous to have survived and have experienced those things. So I think ultimately, I, I love that question actually, now that you brought it up, because can we look at our lives in that way, in a way that is gives us appreciation even for the challenging times, even for the hard times we go through. And if you can do that, if you can really come to that place, then you have that peace of mind, even as you go through, a, even as you're in the midst of crisis. And I think that's one of the things that I love about uh, the teachings of Neville Goddard and the, the mindset teachings that I want to discuss with people. It really has around uh, that our mindset and our attitude has a huge impact on our quality of life. So if you can walk through life with gratitude in your heart, regardless of what's going on, your circumstances, that is a miracle in and of itself. And it's going to impact your quality of life tremendously. At least that's what I have found from myself. It's not that, you know, all of us will have a share of our challenges and struggles and pain and suffering in life. But the difference between people and how that journey goes for you is your outlook and your perspective and your um, thinking and your attitude. So uh, I hope that answers your question. It's kind of like a Lily, a different way of looking at things, but um, yeah. All right. So yeah, somebody, uh, Megan says, just have a look for the small things. Absolutely. I think when you're grateful for the small things, you know, simple things like, oh, okay, you know, I have a place to live and I am 
I have a body and it's doing the best it can to function and support me and my journey. I have a roof over my head, clean water, family that loves me. And yes, I have access to healthcare, like all of those little things. Um, and then you also get the big things, whatever they may be that you are grateful for. The more you're grateful, the more things that you attract to you that are likewise. Um, and I would say that was my experience even with health is just this desire to want to have to be healthy and over time being willing to notice the small things improvement incremental improvements along the way that um increased um that brought more and that allowed me to feel better and better over time so i think that's really important to notice the small things and be grateful for the small things that makes gratitude is a path to whatever you appreciate and you're grateful for, you get more of most of the time in life. All right, so um, yeah, this is kind of getting into, we started out with the mental health conversations and then medication and psychiatry, but this is actually going and um, ending it in a fantastic note about miracles and about um, gratitude. And I would say, um, I believe like big miracles are possible. Um, at least that's been my experience with um, going through that journey of, of implementing metabolic therapies and the ketogenic diet and being able to reverse a condition that by most standards and in the conventional system is considered uh, condition that's not reversible. And I think that's that was a huge miracle for me. And I would say that all of these things are possible for you as well, wherever you, you are in your life, um, that you can find healing, you can find, you know, whatever it is you're looking for, whether that is health, or loving connections, or financial abundance, or meaningful work, or I don't know what it whatever it is that you want it can come to you and regardless of where you've been and what has happened. And that's another area where I think I find that the connection between mindset, attitude and mental health really fascinating because by all standards where I came from and what I've gone through, most people wouldn't think I would be here where I am today, you know, left to a war-torn country, lived in a refugee camp, um, suffered like physical abuse, like all of these things. But I don't let that past define who I am today or what I can be and it's the same for you like no matter what you've been through what you've gone through in your life you don't have to be held hostage by that it's important to acknowledge it it's important to work through it it's important to address it but then you can shift your mindset to focusing on the solutions that you want to live the um and the things that you want to experience in your life and you can shift your focus in that direction whether that's health wealth abundance or whatever it is that you want and you can move incrementally towards that process sometimes i wonder if people that hear voices are tapping into things other may not i think we all have like that kind of um psychic ability and sometimes i believe when people talk about voices it's kind of pathologized but spiritual people say, you know, you're a psychic, you can tune into other people and you can even uh, quantum physics and things are coming, you know, research is coming saying we're very interconnected and we can tap into energy and um, tune into other people's feelings and thoughts. So there's, it doesn't always have to be like a pathology. Um, yeah, so I think we're kind of pushing to two hours right now. And uh, I would love to continue this conversation around miracles, appreciation, gratitude, the law of attraction, some people call it. Um, I really appreciate all of your questions and contribution to this conversation and just even making the time to be here. I think this was like a really 
a pleasant experience. Would love to do it again. I'm going to go ahead and schedule another live stream for next week. And um, we can discuss some of these topics more in depth. And um, I'd love for you to share this channel with other people who would benefit from it and invite them to the live stream. But yeah, you're most welcome. Absolutely. God, the greater unknown has willed us all to be here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty cool that, you know, people come can come together on these um, online and create a community. And that's what I'm hoping to do to kind of have a, a safe uh, space where people can discuss and ask questions. And we, there's a lot that all of us can learn from each other and we can we can support each other on this journey. Um, yeah, so I love that idea. Thank you. I post I posted the video to my Substack. Okay, uh, what is Substack? Just to have to write something up. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I have never heard of that before, but I'm not. Yeah, that sound is that like a a blogging or a social media forum? Thank you so much for doing that. Um. And I will also be posting this, um, this live video will be up, will be posted on the channel. So if you're someone who came in um, halfway or um, just uh, towards the end, you're of course welcome to go back and watch the whole thing. So that will be like a on the channel, posted on the channel as well. And feel free if you had questions during the session that was that weren't answered, you can uh, leave me questions and I will make sure that I will address it in the next live stream. Okay, writer's platform. Gotcha. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, any more questions, comments, final remarks? Because I think uh, two hours is a pretty good uh, time period. Um, maybe there are times when we could do longer ones, but I feel like that is a pretty decent time to have a conversation and um, chat. Again, thank you so much for everyone. This has been a real pleasure to, to be a part of. Okay, well, I hope you guys have the rest of your Sunday, wonderful Sunday, if it is Sunday, or maybe in other places, uh, it's a different time zone, but, um, and I will see you probably, yeah, next weekend, and we can just continue with this. Um, okay, excellent. All right, thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.